Good morning. Um, I really am excited and delighted to um, welcome all of you. Uh, I'd like to say welcome to the audience. A lot of people are, are here uh, on site at our offices in Basel, Data Informatics. I see a lot of people on site and um, uh, remote. So also welcome to you guys remotely. Hope you can understand and hear me quite well. I'm not talking of my English, just the audio. <laughs> Is it okay? Okay, I get thumbs up. Thank you. Um, again, thank you very much for joining. Have, have, have we started this to share? Yeah. yeah. Um, I really want to uh, say thank you very much for coming to our first Vega breakfast in 2024. Um, we use, for those who don't know, we usually do this kind of events two, three times a year, depending on the topic and the speakers that we have. And the idea is just to, to, to create a room and a space for, for interested people of a certain topic to come together, have a good talk, have an interesting talk. And I think, and I'm convinced we really have one because I know Edita since a long time. So talking about OCM and the importance of OCM today, I think will be really important um, and interesting topic. And then come together, have a talk afterwards, have questions and answers, and just have a good time, learn something, and um, have the possibility to network with each other. My name is Matthias Fuchs. I'm uh, at Vega since, well, me, well, 10 years. Uh, I have the pleasure to do the welcome. Uh, don't be afraid, I will make it really quick, but I have to maybe speak one or two minutes longer as Edita is still <laughs> looking for her co-speaker, but they will come, they are around, you're sure. So my name is Matthias Fuchs, I'm working at Vega Informatik and um, I will make it quick, but nevertheless, and this is Dagmara, my yes. colleague Dagmara. Nice to meet you guys, so. happy to be with you. Uh, and I will support today Matthias and yeah. of course support uh, our main guest speakers that we are waiting for. Uh, if you have any question in the meantime, <coughs> you can raise hand now, I'm still waiting for our guests, because at the end it will be like additional session, 15, 10 minutes for question. Yeah. Thank you. So before we start, start officially with the, um, with the presentation. Um, and the, first of all, an information, um, the meeting will be recorded. Um, and the idea is that, of course, um, uh, not only today, but also for future generations, we would like to store this information and if someone would like to have a closer look afterwards, you can you can have a look at the recording. By the way, um, I have to say, I, I did not create the slides, but I really like this slide <laughs> um, as a symbol of the recording, although I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure uh, if everyone in the room still knows what this picture has to do with the recording in, in 2024. I do, um, <laughs> because I'm, 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 I'm already that old, unfortunately, but um, I, all I can say is, for those people who don't know what this thing has to do with the recording, you, you miss the great details. That, that yeah. I think it needs a pencil. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, again, back to our topic today. Um, Dagmara will uh, introduce the speakers later. Yeah. Edita and Fabia. Um, the topic of today's uh, talk is the unlocking success and elevating OCM to a, a great pillar of broken excellence at Roche. I won't say that much about it. Um, it will, um, it will come later on. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to take five minutes to um, make the introduction and tell you something about um, our company, Vega. So for those who don't know Vega Informatic, um, I would like to tell you why we exist, where we are, what we do. 
Maybe let's start with our with our mission. So what 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 really makes us or keeps us motivated? Um, the mission is preaching business and IT, and uh, it's it's really it's it's not an easy mission <laughs> being in the interface between business and IT. Um, but I. We know from the past, and we are we are really convinced that this is a very crucial interface for having success in the project. So, how can you do that? Really having um, this, uh, the, the the possibilities to to bridge these two worlds. Well, at Vega, we do it um, mostly based on our employees and consultants, and doing this by having people that know both sides. So having a kind of double qualification, people that really know the scientific perspective of the work, people that also know in addition the IT and, and, and informatics um, background of systems. That's really crucial. And uh, we, most of our, um, and the vast majority of our employees do have these double qualifications, either by having work in a laboratory degree as myself, and then turn into informatics and IT and more technical stuff, or vice versa. And it's really crucial to have this kind of double qualification. So what we do at Vega um, is, is being shown on that slide. So, the people that I just told you having this double qualification, they are really um, collaborating very closely to provide this what we call 360 services. So it's really end-to-end -end services in, in mostly the pharma, life science, healthcare, informatics. Um, and it's it's ranging from process engineering to software routine maintenance. Um, you could also say it's it it it, it covers more or less the complete life cycle of this of this kind of of this. Um, applications and system could start really from uh, evaluating, supporting customers in a new, in an RFP, uh, so, so evaluating new, a, a new systems um, like a new LIMS, like a new L, uh, ELM, whatever data warehouse. So we support you with, with finding the right vendor, finding the right system, and then go through the whole workflow by having informatic solutions as an ex pillar of excellence, which means there's technical people that are able to create custom interfaces, custom modules um, to the systems. The lab and research for people where we have um, uh, really the deep knowledge of um, most of the market leading uh, systems out there in, in terms of Lindsay and biobanking, data warehouse. Sample logistics, biobanking, all these smart labs concepts, all the kind of digitalization processes and, and, um, and projects that are. That are um, going over to uh, clinical development IT, or um, slight different focus, more data related, so uh, data being produced somewhere, and if you enter data information, you're going to analyze this data. Um, Create the data warehouse, create the analytics, create the um, information reporting out. Down to really um, systems that are in a GXP regulated environment. And also there we have the huge center of excellence, um, CSV and QA. So Vega is also able to um, help and support you in creating, evaluating the system, implementing the systems, and down to really getting getting them validated. Um, of course, by the end, um, the QA has to make the last um, signature. You know, that's that's the only thing we can't do for you. Um, but all in between um, is, is, is what we, where we can solve. Last but not least, from my side, and then I'm, I'm, I um, will be quiet. Um, our upcoming events. I mean, we are we are really active um, out there on conferences, uh, giving speeches, just participating. Just to name three of the next upcoming events, in case you in case you are interested. All of these events is where, where we are present. Um, the ISP um, in, in Gdansk is the next one coming soon, in fifth and sixth of July. I think we have a presentation. They're talking about AI. I mean, everybody talks about AI currently. Also, we also do AI in pharma uh, in Gdansk in Poland, a very nice city. Uh, I, had, I had the pleasure to be there. It's a beautiful city with um, great people. The next upcoming is June 10 to 14th, the MedTech Summit, where I 
don't think we have a presentation, but Christoph uh, and maybe some other colleagues will be around, so you will have the chance to talk. Some medical um, um, device uh, conference. And of course, here in Basel, for people um, that are, for, for those of you who are, who are regionally related, here at June 26th, the Future Labs Live. And we do have a presentation. There is speaker Nicola. Nicola will talk about AI in drug and R&D and <coughs> the impact of, um, of, of, of AI in drug and R&D in data and change management. So don't miss these events if you're interested. We have great presentations, we have great people there. And um, most of them, I think at least the Future Labs is for free. So enough from my side. Um, I would like to hand over. Yeah, and it will be short. Not because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, not because uh, it, it wasn't interesting what you said. We just consume a lot of time. Uh, from our speaker guest um, yeah. presenting what Spica is achieving, what providing. Uh, but to be honest, I'm really proud that we have uh, today with us Fabian Pusaro and Edita Vienska from Roche. Um, I have also pleasure to work with them in the part of the OCM change management, as we call it, in a program management, R&D, IT, diagnostic, informatic. I know that both of them, they are very young, Yes, but they are having a lot of experience, a lot of experience in Roche, diagnostic, informatic and pharma. Uh, I'm really happy that we can jump to the presentation and have opportunity to hear what they achieved, because it's really important from the OCM perspective, from the program level, and it's also very important for the Vega. So the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Dagmara. Thank you, Matthias. Now we need to switch presentations, so a bit of the technical. Yes. <laughs> I will repeat, if you have any question, please, at the end, it will be time, like 10 minutes, just to save time for the presentation from Edita and Fabian. Yeah. So, Matthias, uh, briefly about uh, Vega, we also have a slide that's officially always the Ross, uh, um, Ross starting a presentation. So, we with Fabien, we represent uh, Hoffman and Ross, or Michel Ross, um, our big company. And typically, you hear uh, about uh, pharma of Ross, all the great achievements in a drug discovery, all the Nobel Prizes in that uh, area. But today, actually, we will not focus on the pharma part. We will focus on the, not the smaller, many people think it's a smaller brother. Now it's a twin of uh, diagnostics. And we will tell you about what we were doing for the last now three years uh, in um, R&D of diagnostics, how we were bringing digital, um, digital lab. Uh, of course, those two towers you see here, they are primarily pharma. Diagnostics only occupies few floors of the headquarter. The main diagnostic headquarter is in Rotkreuz, where Fabienne is working. I'm based here in, in Basel, and we are spread out uh, across the globe. Um, and uh, yeah, in comparison to pharma, uh, though, like where you don't want to be the customer of Rosh, and I, nobody, I now wish, you know, guess you are uh, taking our medication, but I think on a Regular basis, you benefit from our diagnostics offering. So all the tests during the COVID, probably many of you used our, our tests, but not only. We are pursuing and sequencing and tissue diagnostics and many, many, many others. And with that, Fabian will start the, uh, our presentation about what we were doing and how OCM is contributing to the success. Thank you, Lisa. So welcome everyone to this uh, breakfast this morning. Um, yeah, so as you seen in my biography, so I am the uh, industry lead um, for our digital lab uh, program, so focusing on equipment management and on change management activities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cool.
Yes. And um, yes, so as um, um, Daimara uh, just mentioned, I mean, we've been working on uh, change management for a few years uh, together, and this is going to be the focus of today's session. So first of all, I mean, what is uh, change management and on what concept is it uh, based on? So, and one important part is the ADCAR model. So it's a, it's a model that is widely used in the industry, and it stands uh, for awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, and reinforcement. So um, it's, it is based on the concept that organizational change can only happen when individuals change. So this is the important part. Um, and many times it can fail because employees know that a change is happening. Uh, however, they don't see what is important and they say, what's in it for me? Um, so, and sometimes it's because the leaders, they don't know how to convey the, the right strategy. So this is, you know, what happens. So with the ADCAR model, we can circumvent most of those issues because we first give awareness on why we need to change. Why? And people don't like change. People always resist change. Um, so we need to make uh, people aware of that. <clears throat> and we need to ensure that we create desire, uh, appetite for change. Um, and of course, the knowledge, it's important. Communicate what is going to change, how is it going to impact your organization. So this is what is important. Um, and then the ability, uh, because when we change, uh, in many cases, we need to implement certain skills, certain behaviors, and this is what uh, the ADCAR model is, um, uh, is helping us with. And of course, we need reinforcement because once we have started working on the change, we need to make sure that we are maintaining it. And uh, we will talk about the metrics later on because metrics are really important to measure the success of the change that we are uh, going through. So um, at Roche, so we have normally five pillars of OCM. This is, uh, I mean, we have adjusted that for our digital lab program, but overall we have communications. Um, so again, you know, that can be through newsletter, that could be through lunch and learn events, uh, that could be through uh, any types of communication, G sites, etc. We have also the trainings, of course, because we need to train the people on the change. And in the ca case of um, digitalization programs, like like digital lab. So of course, training is really important because we are onboarding new users. Uh, in our case, we are onboarding hundreds of users this year um, on the, the platforms I'm responsible for. So training is absolutely key. Sponsor is also essential because once we have the buy-in from the management and we have a certain level of sponsorship, then of course, it makes things uh, easier to, um, uh, to implement. So uh, this is important. Coaching, um, once we go through change, uh, and especially you know, with training, so we still need to coach people, coach the organizations, people who are part of the change and people who are just uh, going through uh, the change. And also uh, making sure that we uh, focus on resistance management, because sometimes there are people who say, oh, you know, I've been working like this for the last 15 years, why should I change? So this is important. And uh, OCM seems easy like this, uh, but it's not that easy. It can be complex, so we always uh, need to be prepared. So this is the key message. So it's something that, we, that requires structure, and we need to make sure that we are prepared. So before I go on to how we implemented OCM for our digital lab program, I will present this video about the program, uh, and this is uh, something that conveys the vision of our program. It's meant to be inspiring, and it represents um, the um, digital solutions that we are we are implementing. So we have two main pillars. So one is on the lab methods, and you've seen a few examples. For example, with the NIMI bands, so scientists can just log onto their their profile on a tablet or on a laptop. Um, but uh, there we also have quite a few um, applications related to um, inventory management, as you've seen, you know, scanning uh, items in and out of uh, inventory. We have equipment management uh, um, applications, booking applications. So we have quite a few things. So um, this is the intention uh, that we have for uh, Digital Lab. And uh, here, the three main uh, objectives are to simplify. So simplify the processes, the systems that we are using. As you know, in the video, we were talking about interoperability of our systems. Mm -hmm. So we have quite some applications and the overall architecture is also quite important. So it's also uh, connecting and integrating all the different solutions because 
because if I'm a scientist, what do I need? I mean, I need uh, to reserve some lab equipment, but I also need samples. Uh, I need uh, reagents. So I need quite a few things. So here we are really bringing that to the scientists. So connection is important, but also uh, connection of the data because the data can go from one application to the other. And we are getting there. It's highly complex, but we are getting there. And also making sure that we can analyze um, the data, so making sure that the data becomes an asset um, and ensuring that we're building a strong data science. So this is what, what we do in, uh, in Digital Lab. And um, program objectives, as I just mentioned, interoperability, audit readiness. Uh, we were talking previously about um, regulated environments. Uh, many of our applications are GXP relevant. So, of course, you know, that puts a lot of um, uh, focus on uh, compliance, uh, which is absolutely key in our program. And, of course, you know, we want to generate insights with meaningful data. Uh, and this supports uh, the, the pillars, um, the three R&D priority pillars that we have at Roche uh, Diagnostics. And regarding uh, change management in our program, so I shared with you previously how, you know, how Roche normally organizes uh, uh, organizational change management. In uh, Digital Lab, we have four pillars. So <clears throat> one is around communication. As we said, you know, it's about creating awareness. I mean, the video that you've show, that uh, you've seen is, is part of that, uh, but it's also having our internal uh, uh, site, uh, newsletter, a lot of uh, communication. And, uh, and so forth. So, uh, as I mentioned previously, training and onboarding is absolutely key. Uh, stakeholder management, where we also engage a lot with what we call our chapters, and those are, let's say, the teams or lab managers who are in various countries, and currently we are working uh, with uh, Switzerland, with Germany, with Spain, uh, with the US um, chapters uh, to make sure that we are engaging with those teams to ensure that we prepare them uh, to be onboarded on our application. So stakeholder management is, is a key element of what we do in uh, OCM. And also we are organizing and leading face-to-face -face events. So there can be a roadshow. For example, uh, next month, we're gonna have also uh, <clears throat> our digital day where we will, we will, we will have a booth so this is really important. So this is what we, we focus on and we ensure that we are increasing the adoption rate um, uh, of, of, uh, of our program. So then on the next slide. So, so as we've seen, I mean, change management is a key element of what we do. However, it cannot be a guessing game. Uh, and of course, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. That's a quote from Peter Drucker. So you cannot improve what you do not measure. And the metrics in change management are absolutely crucial. Um, so. We need to understand what uh, KPIs are versus metrics. Uh, so uh, KPIs so are a quantifiable or measurable value that reflects a business goal uh, or an objective, which is more strategic. An objective should be really aspirational. Um, so for example, we can say, well, we want to double the number of users by end of next year. So this is an aspiration. So this is an objective. However, a metric, uh, so it's really quantifiable and measurable, and we should be able to measure that. So that would be, for example, um, so we want to increase the number of users by 25%. So this is uh, really like a, like a metric. So this is just to give you the difference between, uh, between the two. Then um, in uh, change management metrics, I mean, we um, need to set up clear goals around that. And this is the kind of framework that we are using where we need to define uh, clear and specific objectives. And uh, we, we are really using OKRs. So this is what we do. It's about alignment. It's ensuring that we have clear project goals, objectives, and stakeholder expectations. As we've said earlier, stakeholder management is uh, crucial. And then, of course, the monitoring, uh, and this is important to measure the progress. So as we've seen, you know, change is really um, 
it, it's, it's a quite challenging because you need to convince people, you need to onboard them, but you also need to measure the progress that you're making. And it takes time because people do not change that quickly. So this is important to have this effective uh, monitoring, data-driven uh, decision-making, because some people say, oh, well, we didn't, uh, uh, I mean, we, we published a newsletter, but maybe not too many people clicked on it. So this is um, just a, maybe a per perception. So of course, if you can back this up with key metrics, then of course you're more uh, powerful and you can make more meaningful uh, decision. And it's about enhancing transparency, accountability, and communication. Uh, with, within the team, you know, and with the stakeholders, we're dealing with quite a few, um, so uh, managers, lab managers, uh, chapter leads uh, across the world. So important. So it's really important for us to uh, maintain this kind of communication with them. So regarding uh, the, OC, the selection of OCM metrics, so here I'm going back uh, so to the ADCAR model that I presented at the very beginning, uh, where, for example, for each of the pillars of the ADCAR model, you have some examples of uh, what we can measure. So with awareness, for example, we have the number of side views, so that could be uh, one element. For desire, that could be um, attendance rate uh, of the engagement session. So we, we did a training. So uh, same thing for knowledge, attendance rate training session. So how many people attended the training? Um, how many people completed the training? This is also important. Ability, so for example, number of inquiries, incidents. We have also hubs um, where which communicate also um, information about our program, which engage with, for, for example, power <laughs> users or super users. So this is what we, we have here. And of course, uh, reinforcement. Um, so this is about a sustained adoption rate. So those are examples. And I can show you, uh, of course, a more uh, complete list. And this is an, an example on the types of metrics. I mean, this is just illustrative. But for example, you, we could have the various uh, pillars uh, of the ADCOM model, and then you can have the metrics, and then you have the measurements, and then you can really monitor that over time. We can go to the next uh, part. So here, um, those are, I mean, this, I, I mean, we will leave in the presentation, but this is just to uh, show the kinds of uh, metrics, the measurements, and the description. Uh, and those are the most common uh, metrics that we, we've been using in um, OCM. And uh, here I can show in the coming slides a few examples. So this is uh, one example of our digital lab uh, G-site traffic. Uh, so here, I mean, this is from Google Analytics. And uh, here I took the metrics from the beginning of the year up until now. And you can have the number of page view, uh, the number of users. Uh, so um, what are the top acquisition channels? Uh, in the next slide, uh, we can also see uh, for example, uh, number of users versus new users. So um, in from which countries do we get traffic from? What are the most visited pages? Uh, so this, those are the kinds of metrics that we can, uh, we can think about. Um, and then we also have other metrics on communication, like for the newsletter. So the number of opens, the number of total clicks, the click-through rates, comparison also with uh, industry uh, rating. So this is, for example, what I presented for our Q1 newsletter. We can also have in the next uh, slide, uh, so for example, article performance when we have a newsletter. So which are the articles that generated the highest number of clicks? <clears throat> and for example, we had a very good interview uh, yeah, from uh, Lauren, so he's part of Editas team. And he, he got quite a, quite a good performance because people are also interested in knowing what people have to say. I mean, it's not just, oh, we onboarded X number of users. It's also how the people within the team, our stakeholders, how they go through change. So this is what is important. So just to give you some examples on um, the metrics. So, and here I've talked a lot about change management. However, um, a change can only happen when we are working together. And this is where uh, business, I mean, R&D, uh, the, the organization I'm from, and informatics work closely together. So, uh, and, and uh, this is what we do with, with Edita. We have a very strong partnership with Edita's team, and we could only be successful uh, thanks to this kind of partnership. Uh, if not, I think we would not be in the position we are now. 
So I will hand it over to Edita for her part. Yeah, thank you. And I will take you on a slightly different journey um, uh, to talk what we did in informatics, Russian informatics, to go away from service organization as we were before the, our big change uh, one and a half year ago. And service organization is, uh, what does that mean? It's, it means like not what we deliver, but how. And usually it's about KPIs, how many tickets IT result? You know, are we on time with those tickets? Uh, so this was not really focusing on the, on the tools we were delivering and how they are supporting the business. It was just about our services. You know, are we really performing on time within SLAs uh, done with the business? So, um, yeah, um, um, it's almost now two years ago, Roche uh, Informatics went through the transformation. We brought all the functions together from the diagnostic IT, Roche uh, Informatics IT, and uh, we introduced a new, totally new operating model. And here also, uh, we embraced all those aspects of the OCM um, in, in to our worlds, because our um, informatics now have a new ways of working. So we call call them integrated ways of working. And I will be speaking more about uh, product management. This is what we embraced. Um, and so I will explain you like how we then uh, refocused OCM and how we lift it up. But we also have our integrated structure, so uh, our whole uh, introducing chapters. Everybody now introduced the Spotify model, of course, Rosh also, informatics did, did well. Um, and why I'm mentioning chapters? Because we finally recognize those OCM leads, OCM people, communication, it's important. And we, and we made a home for them, and we treat them now as a really important capability. They have their own chapter, they have their own uh, development path as uh, employees, and then they can really support, like you, you saw, like Fabienne as a business, you know, in all this and communication and training. So it's on both pillars. From one hand side, we're investing on our capabilities in informatics, no longer only engineering or only architecture. It's a soft piece of the informatics, but also we embrace that uh, in the ways of working. So we introduced product management, and I'm not saying it's perfectly working uh, yet. We are still on a journey. But why was uh, why it was important for us? Um, because this is this end-to-end -end and holistic approach towards the end user. It's not only like typically we were having a project, great project team delivered throw over the fence to some support team. Sometimes good um, transition, sometimes just throw off the, the fence and many issues. So this was not really supporting end user. And also usually those pro projects, you know, they, they were run in isolation. So also not coordination of the um, timelines that our end users were bombarded. One month, this uh, project go live. Another uh, week, another one, they bombarded with the trainings, with the announcements, tons of emails and expectations, and people were lost. So we went away from the uh, this project type of the work, and we we converted our portfolio to the product portfolio to have, uh, we defined the, our value streams on a business size and how we then contribute with our digital offering. And what is important that really the customer is in the center, not our services, not our KPIs, but uh, the the business, the end user uh, of it. So um, how this comes together, and it's complex picture. So we embraced SAFE, so this is SAFE methodology, and especially for the digital uh, lab, uh, we are having a train currently out and uh, just about to scale to the solution train. So we are growing and we have our product management um, um, methodology. We partner here with the Gartner. So if, if any of you saw the Gartner uh, pictures, this is like what we what we took. And we really try to combine both to not run it just uh, in isolation. And very important element, uh, it's here uh, and it's continuous here in this inner circle. It's a market, communicate, sell and consume. This is the heart. If the product is not used, why we keep it? Why we then spend the money? So, it, and you see, it goes through the, all the phases of the product management, from the envisioning, through the strategizing, uh, value delivery, planning, and value delivery. So this this is core element, and it's 
really we we fit it to also the how we work with our customers, how we work with the uh, in the diagnostic is a value stream leads in a program in a pharma our, our POs uh, so product owners, uh, so that this really goes hand in hand, and really um, and you. If I can give a nice example, because like our product managers, and we saw Lawrence and the many clicks, are also responsible for that change. They are ambassadors of the change towards the business, but also towards the team. We also try to take our product teams on the same journey, uh, try to walk in the business shoes. That's why we also make an effort that those guys are coming to the business, to the laboratories. So our uh, business is also helping us to organize that they feel how those people are feeling and can really then uh, the work on a product in a way that it's fulfilling the, the user needs. And now how this comes together. So this is a bit of the visualization from now OCM perspective because the, our art is quite big. It's uh, compassing and it's still growing now. It's up to eight products. So we have uh, eight product teams with many squads in those uh, product teams. And uh, what we introduced in, a, in informatics is that on a product level, we always try to have OC, OCM lead. So that really the person who supports us, product manager and product owner, in terms of the communication, in terms of the training, those are the people who knows how this product is working or was working before, what is changing, supports the Fabienne and her team uh, in that communication, in that training, in those materials, uh, setting up, you know, those are also usually validated systems for diagnostics. So I have to also say, um, um, configure our training tools for the training records, everything needs to be compliant. So uh, we have all those OCM needs on a product level, but it's still not enough. We need to, we needed to introduce also the OCM on the art level, how this all comes together. And you saw maybe on a video, one aspect is the NEMI band. And that scientist comes and, you know, lock nicely um, to, the, to the computers in the laboratory. And there is an ELN. And then, then there is a, our equipment management in, in grid. They all also have in releases. They have the features. So it's not enough just, you know, those OCM leads on the product level running around and promoting the products. It would be, again, overwhelming to the, to the end users and probably drive Fabian nuts. So that's why we need to, we, we introduce also a person on the art level to really orchestrate and also to manage a bit better what goes when and what we communicate when that, that the users are also not overwhelmed with everything which we are producing uh, on an almost daily basis. So that's why for us, uh, it's a quite a team with the business with the with the usually it's a ladies it's a ladies yes. business yes. OCM is a ladies business, so currently on the train we have almost four up to five and we are still recruiting, and also recently scaling what we delivered for the diagnostics to the pharma. I see a few people from the Pirate, so also for Diwa for the Pirate Center we start now reusing the same concept and the same even tools, so we also need it like to scale up and start learning what our period colleagues did in terms of the OCM, what we are doing here, and how, how to roll this out together. So this is how we embracing now also OCM and lifting up from maybe more like less engineering, but like really sympathizing with the, with the end users. And with that, Fabienne, we are ready for questions. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for the journey that you've uh, gone through. I was just wondering, when you talk about um, awareness and you're going out to communication, how much was it about designing, engaging with them about what the problem really was first and the solution? Or did you actually really go to them with, uh, we're implementing this system and now we engage you? I would say it goes both ways because, <clears throat> I mean, my philosophy as well, because I've, I've uh, worked on uh, software development for more than 25 years now, 
And uh, my philosophy is always that, you know, we always need to ask the users what their challenges are, what, what do they need? So for me, it starts there. And for me, this is, you know, what we take into account for the design of our applications. So point number one. So of course, you know, once, I mean, we need to digitize the process, as you've seen in the video, when we go from paper to digital world, sometimes uh, there are nuances on the way the processes were working and uh, uh, the, the workflows from the scientist may slightly differ. So this is where we always need to consult them, even when we are designing those new applications. So of course, we have understood their needs. We check with them if this is still okay. So we can, for example, show them prototypes and get validation uh, on that. So sometimes they may say, yeah, this is kind of okay, but you know, we would like to check a few things and in the end the intention is to make sure that we have at least uh you know it's a coverage of 80 percent of their needs and by then you know we are quite successful and let's say if 80 percent of their needs are covered if 80 percent of uh the, the users are happy with the applications that we're delivering and of course then it goes uh also you know in the other direction where we are communicating on that and this is where also change management comes into play so um, yeah, it, it goes both ways. So collecting the needs, checking uh, certain assumptions, uh, checking prototypes, uh, adding also focus group sessions. We do that a lot uh, so that then we can really, uh, let's say, confirm that we are heading towards the right direction. And of course, once we have a new release, a new software release, then we can, of course, communicate that to the users. And as we've seen before, it's about training and onboarding uh, the users. So it's, right. both ways. it's a little bit beyond awareness, actually, then, because when I yes. saw awareness, actually, there's a little bit more around activation you know, in that change. Follow up question then. You started the presentation by saying it was to increase the capacity, really, of the time that they had. Mm -hmm. In the adoption metrics, how are you measuring that? I didn't see that because actually there should then be that they have more time in their yeah. day in which to um you know do the work for the patients because the system has saved this much percentage yeah. are you there yet and it's okay <laughs> well, we, we, so as you said you know it's a, it's a journey so um of course our intention is to measure that uh okay. because um let's say if we are um digitizing um, so let's say the booking of the instrument. So it's true that today what people can do, they have those big uh, machines and they would just put a post-it note and then say, yeah, sorry, we need, we, we need to move away from that and we are giving you an application. So there maybe it's a little bit more challenging to measure, let's say the, uh, let's say the, the amount of time that we're saving. But as we said also, I mean, there's the amount of time that we're saving. And what is really important is also the um, the fact that we are ensuring compliance. I mean, yeah. Compliance is also important because today, um, I mean, we, for example, in equipment management, we have um, uh, so a logbook. So in, in some labs, it's going to be just a binder where we say, you know, we change the software, we add a run, etc. So this is the way it works. However, when an audit comes, it's panic because you know, oh, we need to make sure that we have everything ready now with the digital solution so everything is on the uh, equipment logbook and then it's audit ready and then the auditor said well can you show me the, the runs that you did from that day to that date sure i go uh, in the application and then i will show you that so yes i mean there is the amount of time that we're saving for uh, the users and of course that's that's our goal to make the life of scientists uh, easier but it's also to generate compliance and uh, we, we are getting there but yes i mean we we are not where we want to be in terms of measuring let's say the success um but as we are in the process of onboarding also a large number of users this year hundreds of users so yeah there we, we will be able to start measuring the difference between the paper-based process and the digital that, application that's what i see as an interesting uh, piece for ocm to evolve because as technology or ai becomes part of the workforce yes. and actually it's to have this higher value add mm -hmm. that should be something we're measuring that okay how much is technology doing how yes. much capacity are we releasing yes. and i know Roche has um organization network analysis and really then if the ai is part of the network or technology is yes. part of the network then you really get to releasing as you were saying you know what you measure is what you manage yes. if we're not measuring that then yeah brilliant so, to, to the so what we started to measure or we are in a process is uh, for example instrument occupancy because there are you know those those voices yeah. from scientists i always like i i don't have my equipment it's always busy or always always in the maintenance yeah. and so on and so forth 
So what we are introducing is uh, with this change of the digitalization also to start showing which equipment is used or how space is used, which equipment is not used to also make those uh, then, you know, fact-based decisions, oh, yes, those instruments are used. Maybe we need to buy two additional one. This is this time for science then, yeah. you know, and maybe those those uh, are not used and they are just occupying. We need to release the space. So this is also like yes. another aspect, not only this release time, but also bring, you know, like more um, resources to the to the scientists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and see them through uh, yeah, sensors, for example, where we are also now starting to measure the uh, space occupancy, the asset utilization, and then we have metrics. And for example, between the amount of time that was uh, that an instrument was booked, originally maybe the instrument was booked for five hours and it was just used one hour. So then, you know, we can give uh, more tools also to the lab manager site services on measuring, uh, let's say, the success and, you know, the fact that we dedicate more time uh, for science. But there are different, you see, angles on, on looking at that. Yeah, so a question a little bit more of the managing the change and managing the expectations of the end users in the lab. Mm -hmm. um, someone who said early on that I've always done it this way, why do I need to change? Yeah. And it's on paper and mm -hmm. well, that's simple for me. How do you get them to engage in all these different applications, all these different uh, user interfaces? When they're used to paper simple, I don't want to learn another thing. I want to focus on the science. I don't actually want to learn another software. Here, I would say it's a combination of two things. So on one end, <clears throat> it's about understanding their challenges because even though they've been doing the same thing for the last 15 years, they must be facing challenges. And that's that's always the case. So it's really understanding their challenge. And of course, when we come with a digital solution, so of course we have let's say some key points, key selling points and say, well, this is normally how it should change. But then they will say, well, maybe it's not, you know, how I want it to be. Um, so then the question is, yeah, what can we do to ensure that the digital solution is going to address your challenge? And of course, in software development, we can normally do anything. Uh, so of course it's understanding what they need and how we can really um, change the, the application so that it really fits their needs. Um, because there are always benefits of uh, digitizing uh, paper-based processes, uh, and we've, we've seen that. And it's about selling, you know, interoperability also of applications. As we said, a scientist needs more than just one application. There's, you know, inventory, samples, booking the equipment. Um, so th there's a lot. So we are selling that also. We are selling interoperability. We are selling compliance, access to data. Uh, which uh, is not necessarily uh, available at, uh, at uh, the scientist's fingertips to, uh, to do some analysis. So I would say this is a combination of both, but yes, it goes with number one, understanding the challenges, number two, see how the application can evolve to, uh, to meet the needs of, um, uh, of the users and, and the lab managers. So maybe to add to that, and like, um, because there is also the difference between this web lab scientist and then the data scientists. Yes. Yeah? And even bringing those two groups together to really also show those website scientists, like why this new tool is needed, why this additional information needed to be collected, to be able then to run that analytics. So even enabling this dialogue, you know, that it's, it's, they are not just doing an experiment in a wet lab in sake of experiment, that this data is needed. This was also uh, very, very helpful. And sponsorship. Those changes are also coming from the top. And we have a strong sponsorship Correct. from the management that this is the way. It's no longer, you know, what you were doing yes. for 15 mm -hmm. years now. You know, Roche is changing to the digital. Roche is embracing data. And this is also like strong message, which helps us to drive then the discussions yeah, from our management. And the, the sponsorship goes down, obviously from the top, but you yes, have somebody yes. at the site and maybe somebody in the lab yes. that's really being an advocate yes. for mm -hmm. this. That isn't necessarily part of your team, but no, no, but I mean, the, you know, the, the way it goes is that we have also the, the company, you know, the 10 year ambition, you know, the yearly objectives. And of course, you know, that cascades, uh, you know, down in the organization. And then we go from those objectives to 
uh, also uh, metrics as we've seen before. So, um, and this is uh, how, you know, let's say the strategic ambition of the company uh, goes, uh, you know, down to uh, any individual in the, in the company. So yes, sponsorship is, is absolutely key. And that's why we also need to engage a lot with uh, lab managers, with chapter leads, making sure that we're convincing them. Um, and of course, uh, we do a lot of, uh, let's say, pilots. You know? mm -hmm. So, I mean, we have a situation, for example, in Germany, uh, because we are building, a, so it's, it's going to be our flagship uh, building, so all digitalized. Uh, and there, they were a little bit reluctant. Uh, last year, they were, they were still using spreadsheets to manage their lab equipment. And um, we said, okay, you know, let's start with one pilot. So pilot successful, I mean, it was not easy, but now I mean, we're getting requests from uh, the other ones and we say, oh yeah, actually there is a benefit in using the, uh, the application because now I can look for my equipment, you know, with the search engine, uh, then I will be able to access everything in a logbook. I will be able to book my equipment and just put a post-it note somewhere. So piloting is always very important. And this is what we, we propose when we uh, engage with, uh, with a given hub. Um, so yeah, sponsorship and uh, piloting is also uh, important. So yeah, let's start with a small pilot. It doesn't work, it doesn't work. If it works, then it has positive snowball effect. And from my experience, I think uh, this is what you explain right now is coming back to your start when you say it's a complex thing. Yes. But I think the task or the, ch the, ch the challenge is to reduce the complexity. And, and I think very often in my experience, OCM is coming to implement a change. But this is the wrong way. I think the change should also be adopted before we go into to implement it. What, you, what I want to say is, very often, the management is asked, what should we do? The management defines what is the change. But what is very often not done is to ask the users about what we want to change in the future. And I think if we involve the, view, the users much more in definition, sorry, then you as LCM have less to do. Yeah, it's a little easier. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's why, as I said, we've done quite a few focus groups uh, when we started this journey about two, two years ago, because actually in our, in our case, I mean, it started with one group uh, who wanted this change, and then we elevated that at the global level. And of course, um, when we bring, let's say, this kind of program at the global level, of course, it's it's a lot more work, you know, a lot many more requirements that we need to take into account. And of course, we are a little bit slower because we have a lot more functionalities to implement in the application. But still, you know, I still want to make sure that we have focus groups on a regular basis. Uh, that we create prototypes, that we validate that with the users. Is it what you really want? And then, of course, they may say, yeah, this is in the right direction or maybe not at all. So then we can really uh, change that. So I've always involved users in the design of the applications. I mean, we, we will not design something on our, on our site. We will say, hey, you know, this is it and uh, you, you must use it. Uh, that's, that's really not my philosophy uh, in, in software development. Yeah. Um, I would like to start with a, with the comment to my uh, pre speaker here, um, which is uh, we follow the structure people process technology and not the other way around, which is often done. We choose the technology and try to implement that and we follow the structure really people process uh, technology to involve them first. But my question um, uh, was before to this this Pareto ratio, uh, you mentioned 80-20. Uh, so 80% adapters, early adapters, uh, you define as a success. Uh, very often we see that this 20% audience, which is more change resistant, needs a lot of resources. Most of the time, 80% of the resources. How, how do you tackle that to give the, the early adapters the, the, the attention and the resources um, they, they require or they are... Um, able to to make the change happen i would comment because i'm coming from the two words um in diagnostic there is more discipline <laughs> i would call That's it like good news. <laughs> in comparison to fun okay uh, you know uh, uh, and uh, i think there is different understanding because like fabian we don't have a resistant group 20 percent. No. it's less yeah it's yeah. less or those uh 
there, there was also a very strong message from leadership team about unification or standardization of the processes. And please believe us, it's a hell of the work to try to standards all aligned for functions, you know, so what is the core and what are the local flavors. But with the support of the, I would say, from the top and a certain organization discipline, you know, diagnostics, I would say, this um, different revenues, so they, they get used to, you know, like adopting to what is needed and not forcing how I work. And I think this is a bit of the difference which we see with pharma, that the drive actually is, this is how I work. So copy this in your tools, rather than let's embrace that, that, uh, that there is a tool, you know, which also is cost efficient, secure, etc. Maybe I will a bit adopt to the work. So this is that, I think, challenge which we have. And this is what I see the difference between DUAL and digital lab and diagnostic. So this message taken, we have to have more discipline. <laughs> <laughs> and I fully agree, by the way. I mean, what I would like to add to that, I mean, at least from my experience in working with um, a chapter, uh, chapter leads in, in the hubs or with lab managers, I mean, we, we have, for example, one group in Germany, very resistant and uh, very logical. So it's a highly political situation because if, let's say, those people are, you know, not in favor of, of our solutions, we're not onboarding them in, uh, you know, with this this building in in Hansburg in Germany. And I mean, we we worked with them. Uh, we we try to understand their needs. I mean, they have this uh, need for for ice principle, for example. And today they're doing that on paper. So they're doing equipment change, uh, anything. So it needs to be validated through this for ice principle. So I checked with the other hub labs that we don't need that, you know, because we manage that in a different system. And we said, okay, you know, we are going to um, work on this functionality and make sure that we are able to onboard them. And we work together with them on the user workflows and say, how does it work today with the paper version? Okay, this is how we could digitize this for ice principle functionality. And then we said, okay, you know, this, this is close to what we want to do. Of course, we need to make some adjustments because, for example, we need to have more edit users in the applications. I mean, there are uh, consequences to that, but we are getting there. And now we are planning to have um, uh, several hundred pieces of equipment onboarding in our central database and hundreds of users, about 300 users. So it's the largest group that we have in Hansburg in Germany. So for me, it goes really like in partnership. And what I said before, it's understanding their needs, understanding why uh, they are showing resistance and say, look, we, we can work together and we can help you. That's a little bit going back to my question around. May I? <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, just um, thank you very much. It's just we just decided maybe one or two more questions um, <laughs> because we would like to keep the time. Maybe there's people who who need to leave and have other things, so we want to be fair. Maybe two more questions. Um, although I would like to continue the discussions uh, until the evening, but it's not possible. <laughs> two more questions would be okay. And afterwards, I think we will still have the time to have a discussion here. Thank you. It's a little bit going back to my question now around awareness and activation because I thought you went deep, but you've just described for me what's like the iceberg of OCM that when you get to the values, the behaviors, the stuff that you don't see of how people really work, should that not be done in the beginning? Yes, it is. So that it we is. Have, okay, know, so so this it is, is done now, in the beginning. Yes, it, that's what I mentioned. I mean, we I mean, when we design the application and new functionalities, we have what we call focus groups mm -hmm. or we create prototypes and we validate that with them. So for me, this is more what's happening in our value streams. But of course, the value streams who develop the software applications, we work together with OCM. So there again, it's it's another type of partnership where we need to create awareness. Oh, we are digitizing the, the lab processes and what does that uh, include? And then we say, yeah, we have equipment management, we have lab methods. So it's always checking with the users, but this is something that, for example, I do within my value stream. Uh, but we work, of course, in collaboration with OCM to ensure that this is done properly. And once we, we work on the new functionalities, then we implement them, and there we create awareness to a, a broader group of users. So this four-eyes principle is now versus 
three years ago. So. All the way around. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it was it was from the quality perspective. It was in the past. It was OK. And so the people were so that... stuck to it. Yes. That, you know, they didn't see that actually you can do it in a different way. Yeah. Because, and the regulation changed. Yes, because today it's it's still done on a paper based version. So as mm -hmm. I said, you know, people have just a spreadsheet and they, they ask someone, say, can you sign this for me? Mm -hmm. But then they can ask their friends, and then there's no compliance, nothing. So of course, by by digitizing that process, of course, we try to understand you know the processes and the way it works today on the paper-based version, and then we have designed uh, the workflow, how it could work on the application. So yes, you need to log in. Do we need electronic signature? The user do, does the user need to log in again, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we are delivering the functionality now. I think my point is when we say people first, it's often not about the technology, about logging in. There's a deep value or principle or belief that they, and, and it's it's tackling that in the change as well, not just the system side, which is you can do this more efficiently, but there's a yes. deep value in that team culture or that unit yes. culture. Too. Yes. What was interesting, just the comment, that there was a lot of beliefs, what is the compliance mm -hmm. and what yeah. they have to do versus what is yeah, reality. Exactly. Yes. You know, and the, the, I think the big discovery was that they can be compliant with the less of those yeah. steps and the processes. Yes. Not always technology, great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and this is why sometimes you know, between the, the paper based process and yeah. the, the, let's say the and digital solution, the way through. it's implemented can be slightly different. And this is where we also need to tell them I mean, yes, uh, that's the way you were doing it on the paper. This is what we propose on the digital solution. Is this still okay? Are we still compliant? I mean, then we work, mm -hmm. of course, with quality mm -hmm. to ensure that yes, we are still compliant. And we are good to go. So again, it's it's always a journey. It's always yeah. uh, a partnership, uh, and I want to always include the users in the very early stages of uh, the change. One last question. So, 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 so normally with uh, projects, and this may be different because I haven't heard this from you yet, is that normally a, a software solution is selected before you even start. You know. Um, getting people to work on the system, et cetera. So, uh, so, so maybe the question is, um, was the software solution selected before this? No? OK. And then and, and then the, OK, so that's good. Uh, but then the, the other question is, normally when a software solution has, has been selected, when the user needs to do something, the interfaces may not be um, uh, flexible. They may be more rigid. Uh, and I'm not sure if you've got any feedback from the business users on on if it is intuitive for them and easy to actually know what to do, or do they have to go through major training? Yeah, I, I can comment on that. So first of all, uh, we started the digital lab program with a really blank page on the IT side. So we collected, there was a big RFP, um, like what, what to select. Um, to your point about um, this usability, this is another point which we were not mentioning. Uh, we have our UX um, uh, folks also on the team um, to really care about not only this, you know, how the window looks like, how it intuitive it is, but how entire process looks like. Uh, we started to do entire like lab journeys. Yes. How how scientists are really literally walking. We have in a lucid chart really the, the rooms described to also see how they switch through the informatics, you know, like portfolio. And how this journey should look like, you know. That's why we have this home page, like a grid landing page, where they can, you know, select. So this is part also of our like design process. Have this UX research and then UX design, not on the application mm -hmm. level, but on the flow level. And what I can add to that is uh, indeed, I mean, <clears throat> for our application and for our let's say landing page, uh, because you know I'm, I'm the product owner for the what we call Breed, which is the, the digital lab landing page, and it's true that we've uh, we've had focus groups and you know we have our UX consultants, uh, we've validated designs, and for example, we uh, made the assumption of creating a special menu uh, based on what the lab scientists were telling us. However, what we faced uh, with with Lawrence, who is part of uh, Edita's team, is that um, actually. As we are gaining more complexity in uh, interfaces within the applications, we said, oh, maybe that will make this kind of integration more complex. So the applications need to communicate to each other, but they need to be lousy couples. Hence, we are going to revisit the, the landing page so that it looks a little bit more like an Apple store because some lab users may use 
the inventory application, the, uh, the lab notebook, uh, but maybe they will not need some other one. So they can create their own uh, profile. Uh, so we are, let's say, doing those changes. But uh, this is where you know we had a certain vision in mind. We validated our assumptions, but then things evolve, and we have also the technical complexity uh, that that comes into play. And this is where you know informatics tells me, no, this is going to be really too complex to implement. So let's find a way to still integrate the application so that they still talk to each other, and that we can still enable the users to create their own profiles. This is a uh, what what we we have found as a as a trade off. Yeah. No, 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 I'm assuming you're trying to do the min minimum clicks to for yes, the user. Absolutely, well. Absolutely. Those yes, absolutely. Yes, 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 typical UX. UX, you know. yes, yes, yes. Okay, so thank you very much, very, very much. It was really a pleasure and seeing your motivation. And uh, it was a pleasure having you um, here talking to us as a, as a, to host you. And as a, oh, I'd just like to give you a small gift okay. you never value uh, for what, you. what you're uh, telling us. It was really um, very interesting. And um, I hope uh, it was also interesting for you. I see some hand clapping from yeah. our online, <laughs> which is a kind of a good sign. Um, thank you very much. Um, Last but not least, if some of you would be interested to uh, give another talk sometime in the future, just um, get in contact with us. Uh, we will see what we can do. Again, thank you. Thank, thank you very you much. You came from Zurich, coming from Zurich yes. to Basel to give this talk. Fantastic. Thank you, Edita. Uh, I think we will have the chance to to stay here for a couple of another minutes, have a personal talk. Mm -hmm. I say thank you to the people online. Yes. Maybe see you next time uh, in person. Thank you very much and goodbye. We can continue the breakfast. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Feel free to. Thank you.